You know, we had a service, uh, I think it was something like three weeks ago, three or four weeks ago anyway, about living a life worthy of the Lord. And I had some more thoughts that are related very much to that, but I think they're even more central to the subject than maybe what we were talking about then. In fact, I might title this the most important thing. Because, you know, when you, when you boil it all down, it, it really, there's a simplicity to what God is doing in us. I certainly need Him to do a whole lot, but, I, it, you know, it can get so complicated in our minds that it needs to be broken down into something that's very, very simple and easy to lay hold of. <clears throat> you know, Paul spends the first three chapters of Ephesians laying out the uh, amazing gospel and all that God has done for us and, and how, how awesome it is. And, uh, of course, he finishes, you know, now to him who was able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. So, I mean, it goes beyond anything in our, in our power to imagine. But thank God for all of that. But anyway, he, then he launches into, okay, now what? What did he do all this for? As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. All right, so what does that mean? Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in you all. So he, he kind of breaks it down in the, into the issue of, of character. What kind of persons, what kind of people are we meant to be? And of course, you know he's leading into this discussion of the body of Christ and how connected we are with one another. And so that is very central to what he's talking about. My character needs to be humble and gentle and patient, and, and, and I need to put up with people, but what's the ultimate word that is central to everything? It's love. When Jesus was about to go to the cross and he was giving some of his last instructions to the disciples, he gave them one command, didn't he? Just one. What was that one command? Love one another as I have loved you. Now that puts it in a whole different category because we have what we call love among hu in human society and it's you know, in keeping with human nature, which is entirely self-centered, it's basically what can you do for me and how do you make me feel? And it all comes back to me. But I'll tell you, God's love is the very polar opposite of anything that you and I call love in this world. And you think about how it is that Jesus loved. You remember the, the passage we've so often used in the beginning of uh, Philippians 2 when Paul is exhorting them to be of one mind and one heart and follow the example of Christ. And then he goes into what Christ was willing to do, and that's amazing enough, but why did he do it? You know, we know that in the end result, he, he winds up being exalted above, above all, but does anybody here think that that was Jesus' motivation for doing it? Hey, look at, the, look at where I'm going to be if I do this. I'm going to be on a throne. Isn't that cool? No, it had nothing to do with that. It had everything to do with, with sacrificing everything that this world could possibly have offered to do whatever it took for you and me here this morning. That puts a whole new dimension on what he's asking of us. That takes it out of the realm of human ability completely. There's no way that I can love you or anybody in my own strength, because it's always going to be wanting you to come back to me in some fashion. And so he, you know, he immediately, uh, the way Paul puts it, he tells you a little bit about what it takes to do that, because everything he mentions in here is totally contrary to human nature. And, and if I'm going to do this, if I'm going to actually put this into practice and not just, you know, mentally assert that, yeah, this is how it ought to be, uh, I, I need help. Anybody here with me on that? Yeah. We need help. We can't do it. It's, that's why it's got to be Christ in us, the hope of glory. The life I now live in the flesh, it's not me living it anymore. It's Him living it. 
That's where he's going with this. But I'm going to have to humble myself. I mean, that's, that's the thing. Make every effort to, wait, wait a minute, back up. Be completely humble. This doesn't say be humble, be completely humble. Anybody here got that and got, got there yet? Oh, we need the Lord to help us to be willing to, to absolutely let go of all of the, everything that just centers in self and pride. I'll tell you, it's, it's amazing how much we get in the, in the devil, in the Lord's way. We, we get in the devil's way in, in a bad sense. Humble and gentle. Are we always gentle with one another? Be patient. Oh, how patient we are with one another. Now, we sure want them to be patient with us. But patient with others? Forget it. And bearing with one another in love. You know, right there you've got the, the sense, and Paul is well aware of the reality of the fact that while we are, our, our sins have been forgiven, we're very much in a work in, pro, a work in process. And during that time, we're going to have stuff that shows up in our lives that is not good. So what is my responsibility if something shows up in your life and it's really is a real need and it's a real problem? What am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to say, straighten up and fly right? What's the matter with you? And look down upon you? I have to have a spirit of patience and grace. Now, if, I've, if, if I understand who I am and what the reality is, I, all I have to do is look in the mirror and say, hey, you may not have that need, but you got them. You have no business doing anything but being patient with one another because we will have real needs that will provoke human nature. And all of this factors into the reality of what God is trying to do is to bring us into a unity of the Spirit. And he doesn't say achieve the unity of the Spirit. He says keep it, guard it. In other words, if, if God works in a people, a group of people, and, and he brings them to the new birth and there's brand new life in us, that new life in us, that spirit in, within us makes us one. Now, think about what you would do if, the, uh, if you were the devil and you understood the power of unity when you have people who truly are not only inhabited by the same spirit, but they're working in harmony with that spirit. Oh, that's scary to the devil. You think about how the people came together at, after Pentecost there was one heart and one mind and one spirit, and they cried out to God together, and boy, the power of God was there. I wonder what keeps the power of God from being at work in us. Do you think there's maybe some needs in this area? That God wants a people who are so one in their heart. But boy, it, it means learning how to be the kind of person that God wants us to be and reckoning on the fact that my brothers and my sisters are not perfect. And God does not give me the right to react to that in a negative way. And yet we all do. May God give us the grace. If we're going to live a life worthy, it's not just about me and my own personal uh, achievement store. I can say, hey, look at me. I'm, I've overcome this. I've overcome that. I'm a good person. This has everything to do with how do I relate to other people? Because if the kingdom of God is real, if salvation is real, it has everything to do with how I treat you and how you treat me. And that brings it down into real life because we are going to be interacting. We are interacting with people every day in the home on the job, in the store, and whatever. When people see us and, and how they perceive us, do they see Christ in us or do they see just another person who's like me? Yeah, you see what, what a life worthy of the Lord comes down to. It gets into some very sticky subjects that are very, very real. May God help us. You know, I, I thought of so many scriptures and there's more than 
you could possibly use, but I don't know exactly, you know, everywhere I'm going to go with this, but this, is, this matters, folks. What do you, how, how do you think the Lord looks down and he sees two people that are at odds with one another? Does that matter? Is that important? And particularly if each one of them thinks, well, I'm right. I'm doing everything right. It's them. But folks, if there is something in you that is against them, the problem is you. Even if they never get right. That's scary. Am I telling you the truth? Think about how Jesus reacted. Did Jesus take everything that happened in his life personally? If there was anybody ever in the history of the world that had reasons to get mad at people and upset with them and, and unforgiving toward them and all the things that we'd go through, it was him. And yet there was a steadfast, persevering love that continued to be concerned for their souls. God help us. Of course, 1 Corinthians 13, everybody knows, knows about that one. But let's just kind of review some of this stuff and think about in relation to our lives. Because Paul, I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but Paul spends a whole, uh, a whole chapter, again, showing the most important thing. Because he's talking about the gifts of the Spirit and all of that and how, the place that they hold. But now I'm going to get to the, what really matters here, and it's love. Okay? Because if, if I do all of these other things, I don't have love, I'm nothing, basically, is what he says in so many words. All right? So it doesn't matter how spiritual you are. If you don't have love towards other people, you don't have anything that matters. Anybody here need some grace? <laughs> yeah. Love is patient. Oh, I'm so glad God is love because he has to be patient with me. How many of you have gone along in your lives and, and the Lord's brought something to light it's not really nice, not really good. Maybe you didn't even know. You didn't even realize. All of a sudden, God shines a light, and, and you look and you say, God, you knew about that all along. How in the world have you put up with me? But he has. He's loving. He's patient. He understands the process. He's more concerned with my welfare my ultimate welfare than he is in just reacting to every little thing that's wrong in me, like we do. Love is patient. So if there's anything in you, for, for example, if the devil, if this is a weakness, well, it is for all of us, but I mean to the degree that it's a weakness in you to look at somebody and see a fault and not be patient with them about it and allow it to affect how you feel about them and how you act toward them, Something is wrong. That's not Christ. Cutting quiet. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. See, every one of these things has to do not just with some vague feeling. And this is not just an emotion either, by the way. This is a choice as to how we act and interact with other people, even when they're wrong. And it may be. Maybe they're doing some of the same things, but you, somehow you feel like that justifies me being, feeling the way I do about them. When they get it right, I'll, I'll be okay. Boy, was that selfish. That is human nature. It's pure and simple. Oh, God, help us to be set free from those kinds of things. It's one thing to be set free from per some personal habit, but now we, we're talking about how we act with other people. Because you could actually get to a place where you say, look, I've overcome this. I think I said this earlier, but I've overcome that. I'm, I've, I've reached this spiritual pinnacle of achievement. But if you haven't got love in your interactions with other people, you haven't gotten anywhere. You might be just a Pharisee. And you know how Jesus felt about the Pharisees. God help us. But he is, isn't he? 
It, uh, it does not envy. Now, envy, again, is just part of my, it's a natural human reaction to other people. It does not boast. Look at me, I'm how loving I am. God help us. It is not proud. We, not, not a single person here has anything to be proud about when you're getting down to the real fish issues that matter. We have every reason to just say, Lord, I stand by grace alone. There's not one quality in me that I can look and say, this is why you love me. He loves me in spite of everything that's wrong with me. He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. Thank God. All right? It does not dishonor others. How many different ways do we have of putting other people down with our attitudes, our words, our choices, our things we say about people to other people? God help us. All right? Does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not about me. Somebody doesn't pay attention to me. I'm going to pout. I'm going to be mad at them. They're wrong. They're leaving me out. Good gosh. We need the Lord, don't we? We need to find our, our, say, our comfort, our identity, everything in Him to where we can be free from all of this stuff that just plagues the human race. Do you think any of these qualities, if you want to call them that, any of these characteristics are going to be in the new creation? When God gets through with us, there won't be anything left but love. All of our focus will be on the welfare of others and we'll get our greatest joy about being able to help somebody else and encourage them and give them joy and peace and all of that. Thank God there won't be the kind of needs we have here, but I mean, it was just giving somebody else joy. Just like everything Jesus did was for us. Nothing for himself. Boy, it takes the grace of God to become that kind of a person. But is not... The, the plan of salvation meant to not just, like I say, deliver us from the guilt of sin, but it's to make us like Christ. Yeah, that's what the whole thing is about. Not self-seeking, not easily angered. Oh, how we react to this and that. God help us. It keeps no record of wrongs. Anybody here ever achieved that? Somebody did something. And you didn't feel good about it, and you didn't like it, and it hurt you. I ain't forgetting that. Keeps no record of wrongs. Oh, I'll tell you, the, the stuff we carry around in our hearts and our spirits and what it does to us and how it breaks the unity of the Spirit, every one of these human characteristics interferes with the with the operation of, the, of Christ in his body. I mean, suppose, you know, think about the human body. We are so interconnected. Our circulatory system all supplies for the whole body, our, our nervous system. But suppose you started having little interruptions in that. It's not going to be good, is it? God has put the whole body together so that every one of us has a measure of the life of Christ in us so that we can help somebody else. But if any of these characteristics get in there, all they do is get in the way. And we can pretend all we want to. We can put on a smile and say, hi, how are you doing? And in your heart, you've got something. Lord, help us. All right, keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails and so forth. And it talks about the, the fact that prophecies and all of that, they're, they're, they have to do with this, this world and this age. We don't need prophecy when, when the new world comes. There's one thing that will prevail, and that's God's spirit of love, and it will rule over everything. I need deliverance, don't you? Because stuff affects me. When I'm around people, and they act a certain way, or I perceive them a certain way, there are reactions that happen in me. 
I need deliverance, but I thank God there's somebody I can look to who can help me. When I start identifying these things, I say, wait a minute, that's not Jesus in me doing that. God, help me. You know, we've so many other scriptures, like Galatians 5, we read that recently, and that's, uh, but seeing it in this light, I think is important. Uh, let's see, Galatians. There it is. Okay. And he talks about freedom from the law and all of that. But listen to what he says about the, the rituals of the Jews and all that. It has no value, but in the middle of the end of verse 6, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. That's it. You want to break the Christian life down. That's it. Faith trust means I have to trust in him for all that I need to, to make this happen. So I'm looking to him, but I am expressing it out this way. It's faith that works through love, that expresses, expressing itself through love. If there's anything short of that, we don't have it. We can come together and make beautiful music and, and talk about the wonderful doctrines and all of that, but if we don't have this, we don't have anything. May God pour out his love in a fresh new way, not just so I can feel love, but so that I can genuinely love other people. Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay? And uh, down here in verse 13, you, my brothers, we've read this again recently, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Ah, see, it's not just about what I don't do, it's what I do, okay? For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. By nature, we all love ourselves. But loving our neighbor in, to the same degree, that's a challenge. In fact, it ain't happening without the new birth, without Christ coming in and doing it in and through us, all right? Love your neighbors yourself. If you bite and devour each other, Watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. He's writing to Christians here. Okay? So, I say walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. I need His Spirit to come in and empower me and I need to be willing for Him to empower me and I need to make choices that, that are, that are in, a, in tune with what He is after and what He wants. Okay? Okay? Uh, walk by this. Okay, for the flesh desires what is contrary and so forth. Let's go down here and, and go through this again. The acts of the flesh, verse 19, are obvious. Now, some of these are private. Things you could, in a sense, do in a cave or in a cave if you had an internet, internet access. But they're, they're private, they're personal. There are things where I, I let Satan come in and he gains control of, in this area or that area. But notice how many of them have to do with human relationships. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft. Then he gets into hatred. How many of you have had a strong, violent reaction to somebody that's just, it's a dislike. You call it what you want. But it rises up in you. You don't want to immediately recognize it and say, wait a minute. No matter what they have done or what they are, God has called me to love them. And I have the power to love them if I'm willing. That's some serious stuff, isn't it? Okay? Hatred, discord is when people just aren't getting along. There's nothing that Satan loves better than to divide people from one another and to cause people to have feelings and and, and actions and reactions to one another that cause division. So there's not that really, it's not what he's, not what he's after. Not the, the most important thing doesn't come into play, that we love one another. Discord. Just allowing a situation where a brother or sister are divided from one another. In any way, there's a division there. They're not flowing in harmony. There's not a freedom w within them and how they treat one another, how they think about each other. Man, we can't afford to allow any of that to operate in our hearts and lives. 
jealousy. We all know what that is when you see somebody else and you harbor some feelings about not only, not only do you want what they are or, or what they have, but you harbor these feelings about it. It, it sets you at naught. It, it puts a, div- a spirit of division between you and that person. As though they have something that I want or they are something that I'm, I want. God, just be yourself. God made you. He's never made anybody else in the history of the universe, nor will he ever make somebody exactly like you. Just be you as he made you to be. And that'll be awesome. That's all it takes. God set us free from these things. Fits of rage. Now, some people are affected more than others, but we all have times when we get, when something happens and we get angry about it. And our anger is directed at a person or a situation and we feel justified because look what they did. Is there anything that justifies a fit of rage? Is there anything on the planet that justifies it, that says it's okay because, no. So if anger is a part of your personality, and it is to one degree or another with every one of us, we need to learn to recognize and say, wait a minute, God allowed that to happen because he's showing me a need in me, and the problem is not them. God can take care of them if there's a need, but I need his grace so that it could be Jesus coming out of me and not me with anger. Oh, God, help us. All right. Fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions. Again, you got this discord and dissensions where there's disagreements that just just rise up and we we take one side or the other. Sometimes it's, uh, well, he says factions is the next thing. Well, you got groups of people, this one feels this way, this one feels the other, and they're against each other. God, help us to learn to bring every issue before the Lord and humble ourselves and say, I might be wrong, my, and, and I'm wrong if my spirit is wrong. That's all it takes. You can be right technically. Remember the, the statement that was made in our midst so many years ago? You're right or you're wrong, even if you're right, if your spirit is wrong. That's something to think about and remember, isn't it? And then he goes into envy and drunkenness and orgies and the like. But how many of those things have to do with human relationships? Folks, I need the Lord. I need the Lord. And I'll tell you, if, if any of these things are, are at work in our lives... The devil is loving it. He's provoked it. He knows how we're made. He knows how to point out faults and and to create dissension and, and anything in the world that would absolutely break the unity of the Spirit. May God get us to this place. Uh, it's not about anything that I'm, th- I'm talking about. This is a general principle that seemed like the Lord just brought to my mind. How, how easy is it for us to get caught up in something that is just... All it is is human nature that breaks the, breaks the tie between us. I want my spirit to be right. It's not that I need to work up an emotion regarding you, but I need to love you and see past your faults. I need to do what the Lord does for me. To see past your faults and say, Lord, help that brother, help that person, help that sister. I know they got needs. But I want to have a spirit that's free from reacting to that need as though, oh God, that's terrible or that's this or that's that. I want to be a a source of help and not condemnation. Because if if we desire that, God will absolutely help us to be a help to somebody who may be genuinely in need. Every one of us here has needs. Oh, wouldn't it be awesome if God would just pour His Spirit through all of us to one another? I believe it's happening in in varying degrees. Thank God for the degree that it is. But this is the most important thing there is, is is love. Praise God. I guess there are so many other scriptures that that I could point out to. One thing that struck me as I was thinking about some of these and looking up some of these passages. 
I don't see any conditions listed, do you? It never says love one another as long as. Love one another unless. It's always an unconditional love. Thank God that his love is unconditional. He's not looking to, for me to measure up, particularly in my own strength. Now, he, he's working in me for sure. But his love itself, his desire for my welfare, does not depend upon my performance from day to day. Now, he may be grieved and work, but that's not the same as not loving me. And it's not taking personal offense. God doesn't, God's not like us. He doesn't get offended because he sees imperfections in us. But we do. We react one to another. There are no conditions. Just one of them that I thought about. You know, in, in Ephesians, he goes on and he mentions love in several other contexts. But one of them is talking about marriage and the home. And he says, husbands love your wives as long as they... Oh, wait a minute. If they do what you say, if they measure up to your standard, then love them. No, he just says love them. There's nothing, there is no power on this earth that has more, more power to, to change situations than to show people the love of God. How many relationships could be healed if the man obeyed this? And stop getting upset about this and upset about that and holding against them. Oh, God, help us. A lot to think about, isn't it? There are no conditions to any of these commands. There's no way that we have all kinds of ways now to justify how we feel about this and about that person, about this situation. But not one of them is to justify a wrong spirit in us. Anything but a free spirit that just says, Lord, I love them. I want the best for them. I'm not going to take whatever it is personally. I'm not going to harbor it. I'm not going to hold it. Lord, help me. You know, it gets really extreme when you think about it. Think about the things, some of the things Jesus said. I think Luke 6 is one passage I was thinking about. And he says this, I think it's in the Sermon on the Mount, love your enemies. Now, some of you can't even love your wife <laughs> or your neighbor. But Jesus goes all the way to the nth degree and says, love your enemies. Wow, do I need divine power to do that? You think about believers that have suffered all kinds of things, that have gone to prison and, and suffered been tortured and killed for the gospel. Think about what they did with Jesus. What did he do? I'll get you. Just, you just wait. No, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Man, it takes a supernatural salvation for anybody to be able to do that. We got plenty of reasons to be humble and grateful and trusting in God, but every situation that arises love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, you know, we've heard all these things in the past, to them, turn the other one, turn to them the other also. Someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. There's the golden rule. And it's not do others before they do you. <laughs> this is treat other people the way you want them to treat you. God, help us. You know, I don't know if I've ever actually said this before, but I have often thought this, and I think it actually gets into this in a little bit. I don't know if you realize how that works. In many instances, you know, we, we well, it does say this down further. I'll, I'll just jump ahead. I'll, I'll throw this in right now. We tend to get what we give. 
People that have a bad attitude find, wind up having people that have a bad attitude toward them, don't they? You see that over and over again. You get what you give. How many of you ever thought about this when you're in a situation and you're about to act or react to somebody, perhaps in a negative way? All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, please watch carefully how I treat this person because this is how I want to be treated. How many of you realize that when you're treating somebody badly, when you're having a wrong attitude toward somebody, it's a prayer. That's a sobering thing to think about because that works. That's a two-sided coin. It tells us what we ought to do, but I'll tell you, if, if people have a hateful attitude, it's going to come back. You'll see it down below. All right, and then he talks about if you love uh, if you love those who love you and so forth. Uh, even the sinners do all that. No credit to that. But it talks about how we ought to treat people, even if they treat us badly, then your reward, going down, then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Now, I know there's times when judgment is poured out and God tries to get people's attention, but you think about the, the m times as a general, ca uh, general condition, there'll be a wicked guy who's got this land that needs to be watered and he sends rain. He doesn't say, well, you haven't behaved today, so you don't get no rain. We have a God who's not like us at all. He is kind and merciful. I'll tell you what people are going to, people talk about how, why doesn't God do something? I think we're going to get to the other side and we will be blown away with the patience that God has shown the human race. And how many things that he has allowed that are good and merciful in spite of the conditions. We're going to be amazed at his grace. All right. Do not, now here it is where you see what you get, what you give. Do not judge and you will not be judged. How many of us are quick to point out faults and really just lay it on somebody? It's one thing to recognize a need, but the spirit in which we do that is pretty, is pretty central. God help us to have the spirit of Christ. You know, where, where Paul says in Galatians, if anyone stay overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, go to them, but in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. See, that's what the Pharisees didn't know how to do. They had this self-righteous standard of, of, of being what they, they thought they were supposed to be, and they could look down at people and just say, what's the matter with you? Every one of us is in a position to where we're going to have to have, if, we're, if we see the things the way they really are, we're going to have to have a spirit of patience and love and mercy and a desire to help and not condemn. A, a, a spirit of understanding. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. I pointed this out before. I bet everybody here wants to be forgiven. Right? You'd all love to be forgiven. You've got things that you know are wrong. You want to be forgiven. Is there anybody in your life who has done something to you and you have not forgiven them? Boy, it got quiet. That's something to think about, isn't it? D did Jesus mean this? It's not the only place he said that. I'll tell you, we need grace, don't we? Amen. We want God to forgive us, but we don't want to, you know, we're like the, the, the what was the, the parable that Peter was told about the, the, man, the rich man who had a servant who owed him a whole bunch and he forgave it. And the servant went and got one of his other fellow servants and had, had a little bit, had lunch money that he owed him and he couldn't pay it, threw him into jail. And of course, they, the owner the master heard about it, and the guy didn't wind up so good, did he? 
But the whole point was we need to, we, we've got so much that we've been forgiven of and we are so unforgiving for the littlest things. God, give us the spirit of Christ toward one another. I'll tell you, there's a freedom in that. If we carry around the burdens of feelings about somebody and this and that, I'll tell you, that's a terrible place to get. Forgive and you will be forgiven. And here's this business about give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you again. That's a pretty good example of what I was talking about, how the, the golden rule works two ways. You get what you give. And if we're going to have a wrong attitude toward other people, they, don't be surprised if they have a wrong attitude toward you. God help every one of us to just to humble ourselves. Well, praise the Lord. Look at uh, 1 John chapter, chapter 5, or chapter 4, I think it is. If I can find it. Dear friends, verse 7 of chapter 4, let us love one another, for love comes from God. That means something, doesn't it? We're told what to do, but now the question is, how do I do that? How can I possibly do what he's talking about in this book? Dear friends, let us love one another. Why? Because love comes from God. If I'm opening my heart to his love in my heart, I have the power to love other people if I'm willing. And it's a choice, isn't it? Everything we do that, we, that involves a wrong spirit toward anybody, whether it's an instant reaction or harboring it, it's a choice that we make. We don't have to make, but we do it, and we all do it at some time or other. All right, everyone who loves has been born of God. That's talking about divine love. The only, only people who are capable of divine love are people who have been born of His Spirit. Amen. All right? Been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and His love is made complete in us. It's a point I've made before. What does that mean, His love is made complete? Is God just shining his love, showering His love in us so that we can sh love Him back in some private thing? No, we certainly should. But God pours His love into me so that He can pour it through me to you. And the same is true for every person that He shares His love with. It's, we're meant to be conduits of His love, not just, uh, well, what's, what would the word be if you were the Dead Sea and everything flowed into you but nothing out? I don't want to be a dead sea. I want to be a living channel. I want to be a river that he can, he can put what he wants in me and what he puts in me comes out and helps somebody else because I'm concerned about them. You're, my, you're the ones I'm, I'm meant to be living for. That's easily said and not so easily done. We need divine grace to do it, don't we? But he's faithful. All right, so that's, that's how God's love is made complete. This is how we know that we live in Him and He in us. He has given us of His Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, and that's more than just some mental little th thing, this is a genuine heart that acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God. God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. That's my confidence to live. If I didn't actually have a conviction in here that God loved me, what would I have to go on? Man, this world is a mess. If all I've got to trust in is me, 
Good luck with that. That's the spirit. That's the message, by the way, you hear everywhere. You've got you to stand for yourself. You've got to, you know, it's, it's all about you. But I need to be the object of divine love, and I need to know it in here. That's the only thing that gives me an identity that matters. That's the only thing that gives me a sense of stability, a rock to place my hope on, to build my house on, if you will. All right? God is love. Whoever lives in love, so he's not just talking about some theory here. He's talking about the way I actually treat people in real life, okay? Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how, God's, how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. Now, he's talking about the fact that the, the idea that my relationship, if my relationship depends upon my ability to live up to a standard, that I don't have any basis for confidence. I have a reason to be afraid. But God doesn't want me to live under that kind of, oh my God, am I going to make it? He wants me to know that I have a, a rock, a solid place to put my hope and my trust. Thank God. Thank God. No fear. Fear has to do with punishment. The punishment's been, been exacted already on our Savior. Thank God. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Again, you have the, the, the flowing through us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Now, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but we being human beings, it's obvious that we're going to experience the things that he's warning us about. There are going to be breaks in fellowship between people. There are going to be issues that arise that divide one from another. God help us to, Lord, to deal with that. The first thing that I need to do is to look in the mirror. If I have feelings regarding somebody that aren't the feelings of Jesus, I need to recognize that's not him inspiring that. That's me, and I have something to repent of. If, I'm not, if I have that, I'm not free. So I, my starting point has got to be to have a genuine, repentant heart toward God saying, God, fix me. Take this out of my heart. I don't want to have anything against anybody. That's the starting point. I'll tell you, if everybody did that, we'd be in a great place. But the reality is, there are going to be situations that God's going to have to deal with. And that's where we need to be in a place where we can do something about it. And you remember what Jesus said. I won't take time to look this up, but this is something Brother Thomas used to mention a lot. And I think it's in Matthew 5, another part of the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus said, if, if you go to offer your, your gift, you're going to the temple, you're going to offer the gift. That's what they did at the time. And you remember something. You remember that your brother has something against you. Now, whether it's real or whatever the, whatever the issue is, there's a breach in the Spirit. What does he say to do? Leave your gift, go get it right with your brother. Be reconciled. Do whatever it takes. The thing is, we could be in a situation where somebody else doesn't ever really get right and receive it. That is never justifies us having a bad spirit and saying, well, that justifies me the way I, it proves I was right. If we have a wrong spirit, we're wrong. But God wants His people to do everything in their power to, to deal with issues, that bring them out and face them and say, this is a real problem, this is an issue. And brother and sister, I need your help. There's a fault here. There's a, there's a breach in the Spirit. I don't know how it happened, but I want my Spirit toward you to be right. I want to love you with His love. 
And if I've done something wrong, I want to, I want to make it right. I want to have a, a genuine repentant attitude toward it, about it. I'll tell you, if God would give grace in this area, there's no telling what the blessing that would begin to flow because how much, how much do we cut off the flow of the Spirit by allowing any of this sort of thing to happen? And you get cliques of people that are like-minded and they shut out others and they create all kinds of... It's, it's just another trick of the enemy to divide. But suppose somebody really does something to you. Do you know being offended is a choice? They could be totally, they could be wrong. But if you are offended and allow it to infect your spirit, that's a choice that you made. God can give us grace to see past the fault and to have a spirit that's free of all of that. Anybody here need more freedom and in about every area that we've talked about this morning? Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you, God is, God is patient. He's faithful. Let's suppose that there's a need that's come up, and you know about it. And God's put his, shined the light on it. I'll go back to this. God knew about that. Do you think he's been sitting there saying, eh, get right, I'm mad at you. There's a spirit of love that reaches out and says, I know what you are. I know what sin does to people. I sent my son to the cross to take care of that, and I have the power to lift you out of that, to remove that thing in your heart that's breaking this fellowship to somebody else. You're harboring this, and the devil is just laughing because he loves that kind of thing. And the devil is, a, is scared to death that God's people will get a hold of a simple truth like this because it is the most important thing. And I'll tell you, we serve a God who's faithful. We serve a God who has so many things for us. May every issue in every life be brought before the cross, starting with me, so that we are free to love, love one another and be patient with one another. And I'll tell you, His Spirit will begin to flow and cleanse. There'll be water. The water of God's Spirit will flow and cleanse. And I'll tell you, the Lord... The Lord is getting a people ready. He's, he's doing everything that on His end. We just need to wake up and be aware. We need to be aware how the devil works. We need to be aware of what God is trying to do to bring a people to a place where we're ready to stand in this hour. He's got everything that I need, everything that you need. But God, give us the grace to be genuinely humble. We've got a lot to be humble about if we're honest to be gentle, to be loving, to be kind, all the things that he says to, to one another. And I'll tell you, God is going to work in ways that we have never imagined. There will be bondages broken in lives. There will be victories won. If we can just love one another where we're at and just start there and go forward, God will set his people free and he'll get the glory. To God be the glory.